So it's a pleasure to introduce Pierre-Louis Lyons from uh, the Collège de France and uh, Cerémad. He will speak about interfaces, junctions, and stratification, a viscosity solutions approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say that uh, after those words about Ennio de Jordi, I'm, I feel a little bit silly about uh, giving a few uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, facts about uh, uh, tiny mathematical questions. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, I can see lots of young people in the audience, and uh, uh, I was your age a long time ago, <laughs> and I remember meeting very early on, I was probably only 20 or 21, uh, when I first met Ennio, Ennio de Giorgi, I cannot call him Ennio, that's impossible. I mean, too much respect to my dad uh, for Ennio de Giorgi, or de Giorgi as he was known in France, and he was a regular visitor in France, in Paris. And uh, I remember uh, uh, meeting him early on. I was very proud of being invited by Ennio de Giorgi. At that time, uh, we would receive an invitation letter, real letters, <laughs> and uh, a few lines, very efficient, in a very minimalistic style, uh, inviting me to Pisa. I was very proud because I knew, you know, I knew those papers, I knew, uh, uh, <coughs> I, I, I knew some of his contributions, and uh, you know, so original, so creative. So I was very, very proud, and uh, I, I came a little bit nervous to, uh, to Scuola Normale. And my first day at Scuola Normale was uh, interesting. First, uh, mathematical discussion with Eno Di Giorgi, but very often having a mathematical discussion with Eno Di Giorgi means having a court around Eno Di Giorgi, and Eno Di Giorgi would speak, and the court would, from time to time, say, make a few comments. And, uh, uh, I will come back to, uh, to the interaction. Uh, uh, then, that was, of course, in Scuola Normale Superior, then lunch at Scuola Normale Superior, and then the usual coffee place close to the Scuola Normale Superior, and then everybody walking, not in the direction of Scuola Normale Superior. So I had no clue what was going on. And then I found myself with the group in front of the place where we all stay, you know, the the usual uh, place uh, with bedrooms. Uh, I don't remember the name, Timpano no? Timpano. Huh? Um, so something like uh, 132. And um, people getting inside, and I was curious. I mean, uh, what, what are they doing? And then I remember, I think Carlos Bordone told me, well, Ennio Di Giordi is going to take a nap. And in fact, we are all going to take a nap. <laughs> Okay, so I asked myself, do I have to take a nap? And, and fortunately, I was born in the south of France, and uh, in the, especially in, at summertime, we are used to take naps. So adjusting to the uh, De Giorgi uh, routine was very easy for me. So I took a nap. Uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the interaction was uh, very important for me with, with uh, you know, De Giorgi and all his school. Uh, not only uh, at a technical level, but uh, also very much in the, in the style in which he was doing mathematics and asking questions. I remember vividly, I mean, uh, you know, young, you want to show off and so on, so you're saying, well, I'm, I'm doing this and that, and uh, I said, okay, and uh, I was willing to go into the proofs and give some explanation. He said, no, 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 no proofs. I just want to know the results. And he didn't care about the proofs. And I was struck, because in, in some sense, uh, that was the first time that you know, someone was reacting like that. And I learned a lot with just this simple remark. No proofs, just the statements. And in fact, all his style was, uh, uh, I, you know, if I were to make an analogy with classical music, I would say minimalistic. Uh, uh, very efficient, few words, all important ones. And uh, this is uh, clearly one of the, uh, the greats, uh, uh, the great mathematicians I was uh, privileged to meet. I uh, is one of the few uh, people that uh, uh, really made a change for the way I was thinking about mathematics. 
So for all these reasons, I'm very, very happy and I want to thank uh, deeply the organizing committee uh, for uh, the opportunity to uh, say uh, and recall this uh, a very important experience within the geology, the geology in this uh, 20th uh, uh, anniversary of his uh, uh, demise. Uh, I'm sure that uh, knowing his minimalistic style, he wouldn't appreciate too many great words and, uh, uh, about him, and he would like to know about math. So I have a good excuse for not making any proofs today, because uh, the judge wanted only statements. Well, that's uh, a very good excuse, well, an excuse at least. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, I have to apologize for, uh, because of uh, some serious family difficulties, I, I, I cannot attend uh, uh, this conference in, an, in a, any serious way, and I uh, regret it because, uh, uh, except for my talk, uh, the list of talks you, you will have the opportunity to hear is uh, uh, quite impressive and reflects the, uh, the, the importance uh, that the Georgi had on so many people. Anyway, uh, interface junctions, uh, stratification, uh, it's a joint work with uh, uh, Takesu Ganedis. Uh, the origin is part of my Collège de France course in 2015-16, uh, uh, and uh, it's also a preview of part of my Collège de France this year. Uh, and there is a detailed announcement uh, uh, for this uh, uh, body of works in, uh, uh, in the... Um, and the Conti Academia di Lince. Hmm? Okay, so uh, what, I, what am I going to talk about? So let's move directly to the interfaces. So the simplest interface you can think of, let me try to use this. Okay, maybe this one is going to, is better, yes. Okay, so uh, let's move to the second line uh, directly. So the uh, simplest interface you can think of is uh, certainly a line and a point in the middle and uh, on the left, you have a certain equation. On the right, you have another equation. A multidimensional multi uh, variant of these would be an equation on both sides, let's say, of a plane, of an hyperplane. Uh, that's what I call uh, an interface. I will describe in a minute what kind of equations I'm interested in in this talk. Uh, junctions. Junction is, instead of having two lines meeting at a point, you're going to have a finer number of lines meeting at one point, OK? could be segments, it could be half lines. Of course, we will worry about what happens near this point. The multidimensional version of that would be, let's say, in 3D, just to have an example, uh, would be like uh, these situations when you have three planes meeting along a line. Okay, so that's a, a multidimensional junction. And so you would have equations on each of those half lines or equations on each of those half planes and uh, uh, all those meeting, uh, for instance, along a, a longer line. Stratification, that's a, 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 um, a, a word that was coined, I think, first by Alberto Bressan. It uh, would be a, a situation where you have, uh, let's say, as an example, think of an half plane and a line meeting this half plane. So you would have on the left an equation and on the line uh, the, uh, uh, an equation. Uh, of course, uh, you have some boundary conditions elsewhere, but what happens at the meeting point? So uh, what do I mean by equation here? I will mention other type of equations, but as Luigi mentioned in his uh, in, in the title, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, look at viscosity solution equations. Uh, in other words, those are equations which are basically scalar, uh, for which you have at least formally a maximum principle, and in some sense they are uh, non-conservative. There is nothing like uh, conservative, uh, co conserved quantities. Okay, so let's try to move. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, describe all this. Uh, um, why and who? Uh, why do I care about this? Many, many, many reasons. And uh, one way to see that is to uh, observe that there is already quite a, a substantial literature on uh, uh, various of those examples I mentioned. Uh, I want to mention uh, first the uh, contribution by El Metesona, which, uh, however, doesn't contain any interface, any junction, whatever, or, uh, or stratified or different dimension, dimensional uh, uh, domains. Uh, uh, but he was the first one to realize 
that uh, depending on the behavior, let's say at the boundary, uh, what kind of boundary conditions we should invent to, uh, uh, to understand some kind of non-usual behavior near the boundary. Why am I mentioning behavior is that typically I'm thinking of equations which are related to calculus of variations like Hamilton-Jacobi equations connected to uh, calculus of variations, Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equations connected in the same way uh, to the uh, uh, optimal control or differential games both deterministic and stochastic. So, Sonner, Many, many authors. I want to mention uh, uh, Guy Baal and, uh, and uh, his co-workers, and I also want to mention Amber and Mono, which are in some sense the closer to uh, what we uh, dealt. Um, many of those motivations for these problems come from indeed from optimal control. So typically optimal control set on networks, all kinds of networks. The type of uh, drawings I made are just examples of continuous networks. So uh, whenever uh, you have a phenomenon and you want to control it, which is taking place on networks, you're going to have equations of the type I'm looking at. Uh, so that's uh, one of the motivations. The other motivation is also that uh, uh, it's one way to, to go into the directions of discontinuities. Some of you may know that viscosity solutions um, are, I mean, continuity is built in the uh, viscosity solution theory. You need continuous solutions, or it's easier to work with continuous solutions, and certainly you need continuous data everywhere, essentially. And uh, so uh, clearly a discontinuity in some sense is an interface. You have left of the discontinuity, right of the discontinuity. Um, my motivation, however, came from uh, various models in mathematical economics. It's related uh, but, uh, to midfield games. I mean, the, a theory some of you may have heard me talking about, but uh, you can relax, no mean field games today. And uh, I, I want to mention, uh, uh, I will mention three types of uh, mathematical economics modeling. Uh, one is something that we did with uh, Yves Ajdou uh, and Jean-Michel Lasry, and two economists, Pierre-Noël Giraud and uh, uh, José Schenkman. It's about mining industries. So I, I'm not going to describe more. Let me just say that in the end, you end up with problems which are related to stratification and so on. Um, and uh, that at the end, so we are proposing a model, we are analyzing uh, theoretically the model, and then we are comparing with uh, decades of data. And uh, you can see, you can find the comparison online. Uh, and um, we are quite proud about the, uh, the comparison with real data. Um, <clears throat> And uh, uh, another example uh, was uh, given to me by uh, Benjamin Moll, uh, uh, a very young collaborator uh, uh, of mine who is an economist in Princeton. Um, and it's the, uh, the attempt to go beyond uh, rational ant anticipation. Uh, I, don't, I really don't have time to, uh, to deal with that. But basically, uh, this is a situation where you would have something analogous to two equations on, uh, on both sides of an earth plane. Anyway, so just a few motivations and quite a few uh, references. Well, I'm not going to discuss today are other examples. Uh, so th those are more isolated singularities. Uh, but I want to mention uh, this one, which is fun, and for which uh, clearly one has to deal with equations which are not elliptic equations. OK, so uh, uh, typically for Hamilton-Jacobi-like equations, I will explain this word shipping here. Uh, here you would have, this is a stationary version. It's uh, like having the econal equation, which after all governs optimal transportation. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation on an elf plane, here you have, an elf, uh, you have a boundary. And uh, on the boundary, you have what is called state constraint sonar uh, boundary conditions, which mean that uh, if you try to move an object from here to that, uh, uh, to, 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 to that situation, you cannot get out of this region. So you can rebound, follow the boundary, but you have to stay inside. But in the end, you want to go to this place, zero, zero, and at that point, 
Uh, this is related to uh, the law of supply and demand. Uh, you have a nonlinear Neumann boundary condition. So it's a, another economical model, and it's really uh, very much related to shipping industry. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, typically, uh, you may have various ports. Here there is only one. And that's the type of situation that uh, indeed oil tankers are looking at. Uh, because depending on the local prices, they may uh, decide to go to a different port than the one initially, uh, uh, initially thought. Anyway, so uh, the, the best, uh, uh, I was sure that I wouldn't have time to describe all those other examples, so I talked about what I decided not to talk about. Okay, is it clear? Well, I did talk a bit about it. Well, anyway, forget it. Non-conservative equations, uh, 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 yes. Uh, but other examples that I won't be discussing today concern uh, conservative equations. In fact, uh, think of networks. Uh, instead of having an optimal control, you may be interested in conserved quantities, conservation laws. There is another literature about conservation laws on, uh, 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 on uh, continuous networks. Many, many open questions, and in fact, the, uh, the, the, the techniques uh, that I will briefly allude to in this talk also apply to solve these, those problems. Um, I will deal only with continuous solutions, no jumps at the bad points or at the difficult points. Uh, uh, there is an easy extension which consists in prescribing jumps, but that's, uh, it's just the same. Okay. Our goal is to describe very briefly a general in viscosity solutions style PDE theory to study systematically all those problems. Uh, and for general equations, because most of the contributions I mentioned, which are very interesting contributions, are very often concerned only first or second order situations with techniques that do not extend and very often require convexity, which reflects optimal control. Uh, so we want general nonlinearities. We don't want to worry about first or second order when it's not necessary and so on. So uh, I, 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 I will certainly not try to present this uh, general theory. I just want to sample our results and uh, describe a few of the ingredi ingredients, with, uh, some of which may be of independent interest. Uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, go very briefly uh, through the... Uh, 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 uniformly elliptic case, nonlinear case, so fully nonlinear elliptic situation, with a 1D junction, so you have a bunch of uh, half lines uh, meeting at a point. And I'm going to write equations, and I want to use this because that's part of the general uh, tricks. That's, uh, here is only a notation. I want to use different coordinates on all those half lines. So clearly, I want to think of this as being embedded in a k-dimensional space, right? It turns out here that the angles won't play any role, so it's only a lines, and then we'll have to decide about uh, what makes sense at the meeting point. Uh, so uh, the, the, you can think that uh, you have a function which is defined on this union of half lines, so I, I will call it u. When restricted to one half line, I will use u1 of x1, but in fact, there is a single function. And uh, I insist upon that point. I don't want to look at this as a system. It's more a single function, a single equation or problem set on, a, on, on some kind of closed set. Okay, so um, uh, some, uh, uh, here is an example of equations you may have on those half line. A certain function different on each half line, xi, that's a coordinate on the half line, du over dxi, d2u over dxi. Uh, this sign condition on the derivative with respect to the last slot, uh, which really uh, only means that the equation is uniformly elliptic. And then the, uh, a, a very simple observation is that uh, you, the, uh, 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 the, what are the boundary condition that makes sense at that point? I don't, want, I, I don't have time to, uh, 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 to explain more, but let me just say that if you prescribe a function g, which is an increasing function of p1, pk, z, uh, uh, which is increasing in all variables and strictly increasing with respect to the uh, 
uh, to something that will be replaced by derivatives, then you have a unique C1, in fact C11 solution of this problem, namely solving all those half lines. And you know, on top of that, you prescribe, you prescribe this combination of derivatives at that point. Uh, you, have a, you can think in terms of systems, although I said I don't want to think in terms of system, you can still want to check that you have an equation and here you have only one boundary condition. No, you have n boundary conditions because u is continuous. So the values of u match along all those lines. That's n minus one conditions plus this overall balance of derivatives. Um, okay, so uh, the proof, uh, I said no proof, but it's just, you just apply classical maximum principle. And that's the only uh, uh, boundary condition that makes sense which, are, uh, 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 which preserve a maximum principle. For linear elliptic operators, and if you insist upon the linear boundary condition, the only choice you have is just a solid choice of weights. Okay? So, uh, I, uh, think about uh, electrostatics and the Kirchhoff uh, uh, condition, uh, where basically all the coefficients might be one. Uh, if you have divergence form equations and you insist on having a conservative formulation, uh, then clearly these weights have to be related to the diffusion coefficients. Um, why do you need uh, such a condition in a linear setting? Well, when you have elliptic equations, you should, I mean, I always think a little bit about the probabilistic interpretation. Behind the Laplacian, you have a Brownian motion. So here you have a Brownian motion, you have those, uh, uh, you, you have those lines meeting, so you inject a Brownian motion on an half line. Very quickly, it will go to the, uh, to the junction. And there, what it's going to do? Well, you have to decide how to split it, right? So we switch probability, it's going to go to, uh, in one direction or the other direction. Fine. Okay, that's already a balance, but there is more than that. Because immediately when you have decided it goes in one direction, it comes back very, very quickly. Okay, that's the properties of the Brownian motion. It oscillates around zero. And so whenever it comes back, you have to de decide again. So clearly you have to make a statistical balance of all those crossing and choices you make, and they are being summarized by these linear combinations which reflect in terms of in technical probabilistic terms, which reflect the uh, local times in, uh, in each direction at zero spent by the Brownian motion. It's how to define the Brownian motion in a situation like that. So uh, multi-D, exactly the same. So now we have, let's say, three, uh, it's like a, 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 a three-dimensional junction, so three planes meeting along a line, but it's completely general. So uh, you can make exactly the same observation. It's not a theory, it's just an observation. You have an increasing functions of du over dx1, du over dxk, the same balance, but of course you may have diffusions in the y direction, right? And uh, so it has to be elliptic in the, uh, uh, in the y direction, it's possibly degenerate, in which case it's uh, just this condition. In 1D you have no other choice. Okay, so fully non, I mean, fully nonlinear elliptic is not that hard if you uh, just do things carefully. What about a degenerate situation? And the most degenerate situation is certainly a Milton Jacobi case, which corresponds to optimal control. So what you have now is, uh, let's say, a three-dimensional junction. So I didn't say that uh, for, uh, and I should have said it before, is that not only I have, let's say, one coordinate x1 here. Uh, x2 here and x3 here, uh, but x1 is negative on this half line and g goes up to zero. Just because I want the, no the, uh, the so-called outward normal derivative to be with the plus sign, that's all. So all those lines are equipped with a negative coordinate. Um, okay, so here is a Milton Jacobi equation plus u, stationary problem. Uh, uh, in each of those half lines. So really, I'm looking at a continuous function on this uh, uh, continuous network, right? The union of those three lines. Some technical conditions uh, uh, I don't, uh, uh, that I don't want to discuss. Uh, clearly, there are non-unique solutions. And uh, one way is to parameterize by the value at zero. Uh, this is a characterization of the set of solution, which is for real applications, useless. But let's begin with that one because it helps to understand what's going on afterwards. 
uh, so uh, the, uh, the set of possible solutions uh, you can have at such a junction point is a, uh, an infinite interval ending at a value which is attained. Uh, this is quite uh, very classical in the convex case. It turns out that it's, uh, uh, it was not known in the uh, non-convex case. Uh, it's not too hard. Okay, so uh, we have now a continuum of solutions and uh, something, at least a maximal value of those solutions. So, is uh, C bar, or does, it, does it correspond to a maximal solution? Uh, here are the few of the questions I will raise and uh, answer very briefly. Uh, if you have a viscosity, if you add some uh, second order terms, uh, vanishing viscosity method, so minus epsilon u x x minus u epsilon y u y y z z. So I changed notation. Huh? X one x two x three became uh, x y z. Same thing. Uh, of course, uh, we know that's a fully nonlinear elliptic case. We know there is this, a unique solution. And let me take the example of this boundary condition. What I'm going to say will apply for a general G. I'm just choosing this as the simplest possible example. OK, so now we have a unique solution. What, does I, what happens when epsilon goes to 0? Does it converge? Can we identify the limit? Uh, if we have a pure jump, uh, so h1, h minus, so with my notation, I'm rotating h plus into h2, right? But anyway, uh, and I smooth the discontinuity. Again, I have a, a solution, new epsilon. Does it converge as epsilon goes to zero? Can we uh, characterize the limit? Uh, if you do a, a discrete monotone scheme, discretization, again, you have a sequence of approximated solutions. Another example, there is a, uh, this comes naturally in, terms of, in some problems in quantum physics uh, to, to have, a, let's say, a three, for a three-junction, a three-dimensional junction approximated by a three-dimensional domain. So in two dimensions for a 2D junction, uh, uh, what I call fattening is just looking at an epsilon neighborhood of this uh, closed set. So now I have a domain in R2. I set an, a certain equation in this domain. Uh, here, I don't want anything to go out, so think of state constraints, boundary condition, whatever, and uh, ask yourself again, you have approximated solution. Does it converge to something? Okay, so of course the answer is going to be yes, it converts to something. And no, it's not always the same thing. It depends on the approximation, depends on the Hamiltonian, different characterization. So one has to be a, li a little bit careful. What about time-dependent problem, multi-dejunction, stratifications? Okay, all those questions, and I won't have time to spend much time on, on, on them. Oops. A few samples. So indeed, C bar corresponds to a maximal solution, and uh, there is a characterization in terms of viscosity, inequ viscosity solutions inequality, which really insist upon uh, using a function which is defined on C1 of sigma, really looking at functions which are defined on this complicated set, uh, not in uh, different directions. Of course, if it's 1D, if there is uh, always the same dimension, uh, uh, what, what that means is really it's C1 on each of the half lines in 1D, and it's continuously differentiable from the left at each of the endpoints. That's what it means, that's all. Okay, so then uh, you request uh, these inequalities, uh, uh, again insisting upon uh, separated variables. Uh, then uh, fattening in epsilon uh, goes to the maximal solutions or regularization for the 2D junction or uh, pure discontinuity goes to the maximal solution. Um, uh, in fact, this is, uh, I, I forgot to say, if the Hamiltonian is convex. It's not true in general. The characterization is complex in, in general. So here there is an if which is missing. Vanishing viscosity, well, indeed, uh, you, you add viscosity. You have now a nice, smooth C11 solution. Uh, it does converge uniformly to something. Uh, characterization, to avoid technicalities, I will make it only when the Hamiltonians have no flat parts. Okay? So they may wiggle as, they, as you want. They are not necessarily convex, but no flat parts. 
uh, no interval on which they are constant. So then the limit at zero, because everything is determined, as I already mentioned, by the value at zero, is characterized by uh, this condition, the biggest values for which uh, the sum of the derivative is negative and the lowest value for which the sum of the derivatives are uh, positive when I say sum of derivatives of what? Of the solutions corresponding to that parameter. So you have this range of a parameter. For each parameter, you have a solution. Uh, it turns out, uh, how can you talk about those derivatives? Because things are not C1. I will uh, uh, have to explain that. And why is it sup and inf and not equal to zero? Is that because this can jump, this quantity. There are discontinuities in such a, uh, in such a, uh, uh, so there are sharp conditions to say that the two solutions are the main, are the same, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, further facts that I will uh, pass upon. Uh. Okay, so uh, those were just a few samples of the uh, 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 a few samples of results, uh, a few ingredients which are uh, for those interested in hamilton jacobi equations, uh, which are uh, 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 reasonable. Uh, namely, this is a lemma that uh, uh, Jensen Suganedis, uh, which says that uh, if we can uh, look, uh, if we look at the limb soup and the limb inf of the different quotients at uh, at zero, uh, then uh, the uh, equation at zero holds with all those values. So, in particular, if it has no flat parts, uh, then clearly uh, uh, it's left differentiable at zero. So, the derivative exists. And then the, uh, uh, the second lemma, which is uh, slightly more subtle, is to say that uh, uh, as a function of C, if we assume that uh, uh, there is only finitely many uh, and, uh, um, inverse values of any given uh, 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 value, in other words, you have finitely many wiggles, okay, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, p equal d u over dx at zero satisfies always in the strictly decreasing part of the Hamiltonian, except for a finite set of values of c. So here's a picture. So c increases. We know that p is decreasing. Okay. Uh, I should have stated. Forgot to state it. So uh, p is increasing. Sorry. So typically p is increasing along that decreasing part of the Hamiltonian. It may jump. To, uh, uh, to one point where it's an increasing part, cannot stay there, jumps again to a decreasing part, may jump another time, and possibly jumps the last time for the, st for the maximal one. So finally many jumps, that's why you cannot say the, the, the boundary conditions holds by the sum being zero, no, because it may just be where uh, zero is in between. So it's uh, the last time it was negative, and before the first time it was positive. Uh, on the other hand, so it can be dangerous because you, may, you might say, okay, when I take the limit for any kind of approximation, I might just fall on one of those exceptional points. You don't have to worry about that because uh, limits are going to be uh, continuum. U epsilon is continuous in epsilon. So all possible limits, uh, that's an interval. So if you are unlucky, in that interval, you pick up one of those exceptional points, just move a little bit. You're sure to find a better point. So that's, uh, 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 and uh, you have to worry a little bit about those things because the characterizations are not immediate. Okay, it's time to wrap it up. Uh, uh, we're saying, but okay, what I just described is it looks very much one dimensional. You know, left derivatives, right derivative, different quotients, and everything. So, how do you go from one dimension to higher dimension? There are extensions, but they are complicated. Needs requires differentiability in the tangential part, and that's not good enough. There is a very easy way out, which is to say that all the other, uh, all the other uh, variables are tangential, right? And so, discretize them. Discretize them, use uh, discretization. So I'm using discretization not for numerical purposes, but really for theoretical purposes. And when I do that, let's say time-dependent problems. Uh, well, just replace uh, the time values by time steps. Uh, this is the implicit Euler scheme, order one, monotone. Uh, now I have a bunch of, I have a sequence of, uh, with vanishing viscosity, I have a sequence of uh, 1D stationary problem. Okay, they are coupled, but it's a finite a number of those. 
and uh, uh, general viscosity solution theory, because that's a nice boundary condition at the epsilon level, gives you s some estimate which is independent of epsilon. And you know from the 1D results that when uh, delta is fixed, when n is fixed, this converges as epsilon goes to zero. And if you combine those two facts, that's enough to show that you epsilon converge. Because you and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the limit here, uh, and it depends only on n, and u epsilon depends only on epsilon. And that's good enough. Another weird way to prove the fact that the whole uh, family converges. OK, so multi-D, you may even have an equation on the interface. I want to say about something about stratification. Uh, stratification is something that can be dealt exactly in the same manner. So you have now, a, 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 let's say, an equation on the, uh, on the half plane, an equation on the line meeting this half plane. Uh, so uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, the equations cannot be, uh, 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 cannot be fully nonlinear elliptic. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, clearly here you would have a problem. Think of the Laplacian on the half plane. If you have a Laplacian and a boundary condition but at a point, clearly the point is not going to be seen. And clearly the problem becomes trivial. You solve uh, the, uh, the half plane problem, it gives you a value there which is injected in the half lane, in the half line. Not interesting. On the other hand, when it's degenerate, or uh, when you have just generation in the transversal direction, in the lateral directions, exactly what I wrote, you can ask the questions. And again, the uh, Brownian motion interpretation is clear. Inject the Brownian motion here. There is no way you can transform one di uh, single dimensional Brownian motion into a two dimensional Brownian motion. But if you, make, if you look at a process which, which is degenerate in that direction, uh, whose randomness vanishes uh, 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 laterally, tangentially, and then indeed you can make this 1D to 2D uh, connection. Okay, I mentioned uh, uh, maximum principal equation. I mentioned in the beginning that for equations, especially if you want change in dimensions of the various parts of the domain, you uh, be, have to be careful with diffusions. Um, and uh, clearly, conservation laws is a good example. Hyperbolic equations are good examples. Um, I remember a long time ago, uh, Alfio Quarteroni and his co-workers, uh, they were working on the simulation of the whole uh, blood network. Uh, and uh, they had clearly a stratification problem in the sense of having arteries and veins, uh, which are veins are basically one-dimensional, arteries are basically three-dimensional. Now, with uh, Euler equations, we are very close to conservation law, so what they were uh, doing makes uh, uh, what the right thing to do. Uh, I finally understood that it's the right thing to do. Um, with Navier-Stokes, no one knows, huh? uh, because that's uh, really uh, uh, diffusive, and uh, uh, clearly it depends on the type of boundary conditions you have, but basically you're going to forget the boundary conditions uh, for the Navier-Stokes part. And um, that's not entirely clear. So you would have uh, global uh, simulations where you just uh, simulate the arteries and then uh, the veins come afterwards. And we know it's more complicated than that. There is a retroaction, so it's uh, not the right modeling. So I, was, I wanted to mention some of those applications. I wanted to mention, without proofs, <laughs> my initial statement, uh, some, uh, uh, some of the results. Um, <coughs> and. Uh, 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 let me express once more all the, uh, if I may, I feel a little bit uh, the affection uh, I, I had for Emil de Giorgi, uh, but uh, I don't want to, to, I cannot call him Emil, you know, with lots of respect. I, I think I can speak about affection and, uh, of course, uh, admiration uh, uh, for, for what he, he, he was and he is, because uh, his work is with us. And um, I, I'm quite sure that uh, indeed he loved to think about what was going on and uh, about the, the, the everything what was going on. And uh, uh, I would be curious to hear his uh, very pointed uh, uh, sentences about the way the mathematical community is working nowadays, you know, with this uh, crazy. Uh, 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 speed of everything and uh, communicating extremely fast and so on. 
while Ennio, the Georgi, was, uh, always wanted to say, well, I didn't think enough about this problem. Give me some time. I need to think about it. He didn't want to talk about it. He wanted to think about it. And I think it's a good example that we should recall because uh, today we are, going, we are becoming entirely crazy, huh, if you think about it. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat>